So this is a re-release of Maladjusted Episode 3, Greek Life in the Good Society. And of course this podcast is about the history of SMU very specifically and segregation and desegregation in Dallas. But I also created this podcast with the intention of introducing frameworks and topics that are really big in the racial justice sphere right now. This episode is important in setting up a concept that's going to come up again and again, reform versus abolition. Now, I expand on what that means in the episode, and I talk to people that see both sides. In fact, I state my own bias as to whether or not reform or abolition may be the best or most relevant solution in the context of predominantly white Greek life. But what I intend to do is to provide you frameworks that you can adopt based on your life circumstances, your beliefs, and how you want to organize moving forward. So whether you love or hate what I'm saying, I really hope you enjoy this episode. It's one of my favorites. This is a podcast about race and racism at SMU, and how that manifests in the realities of students of color. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Greek life. In a lot of ways, Greek life is synonymous with social life at SMU. 43% of undergraduate students are members of a Greek organization. And for many, SMU's robust Greek system is a huge straw. For example, Kelsey. My name is Kelsey Hodge, and I actually just graduated from SMU. I honestly did not know much about SMU when I first was applying to schools. I looked up the opportunity to be able to major in like a bunch of different things, because at the time I didn't know what I really wanted to do. And then I also knew going into college that I did want the opportunity to participate in Greek life. Kelsey identifies as Black, and she was one of the only women of color in her Panhellenic organization. Nobody in my family is in a Greek organization, whether it's, you know, historically Black um sororities or fraternities like nobody is involved in anything but i think i just came across the idea of panelic sorority from like watching youtube growing up in like middle school high school and the idea of it fascinated me the marketing of it fascinated me they got me greek life offers a community and a home to so many students But the racial makeup of SMU Greek life is overwhelmingly white. And that's by design. There are countless conscious and unconscious decisions that are made each year during rush that perpetuate the Greek system's demographic makeup. So what does it mean when SMU social life revolves around organizations built on wealth, exclusion, and yeah, racism. More importantly, what space does Greek life hold in Martin Luther King's good society? Does it hold space at all? These are all huge questions that I want you to consider as I talk to members across Greek organizations. My name is Shara, I'm an SMU Human Rights Fellow, and this is Maladjusted. Being an SMU Mustang to me means that you adopt the whole spirit of the place and love the campus. Athletics is an important part of the campus. I don't like doing that. There's also a lot of running back in the city of Dallas. I've called him a There are some things in our nation and the world to which I'm proud to be maladjusted which I hope all men of goodwill will be maladjusted until the good society is realized. The Greek system can be a little confusing, so let me clarify some terms before we get into it. 
there are four Greek councils at SMU. First, there's Interfraternity Council, or IFC. IFC organizations are historically white, meaning racial segregation was written into their bylaws early on. So when I was researching for this episode, I read an article by Matthew Huey about people of color in Greek life. He notes that Greek water societies were formed to reflect and replicate the narrow demographic makeup of folks who could attend college at the time. That is, wealthy, white, Christian men. Then, Panhellenic Council arose for women. Their mission remained the same reflect and replicate a culture of elitism and exclusion in institutions of higher learning. Now, there is an added dimension of maintaining distinct gender norms. So this is an origin story, a national origin story, but what purpose did Greek organizations hold on SMU's campus? We can find one answer in a series of articles published by the Daily Campus student newspaper in 1956. Now this is really interesting because these articles were making a case for desegregation. But, this Daily Campus writer argued, desegregation could only occur with a very specific set of social conditions, and Greek life would be integral to making these conditions possible. Here's an excerpt. The Greek system at SMU is organized in such a way that sorority and fraternity members associate frequently at co-functions and at open houses. The object of such intermingling is to encourage dating between Greek organizations involved. But if the climate of opinion on this campus opposes interracial dating, how could Negroes fit into the general scheme of the Greek system? We cannot help but believe that an attempt to force Greeks to accept Negroes as fellow members would be detrimental to the unity of the organizations and to the Negroes themselves. We believe that such an integration in social organizations would be possible in a different climate of opinions, but judging from personal experiences, Students at SMU wouldn't accept Negroes as sorority and fraternity pledges at present or at any time in the foreseeable future. There's so much there. And I hate all of it. (laughs) But this article is so revealing in how race is so integrally tied to Greek life at SMU. Yes, each organization was meant to reflect and replicate a certain demographic of college student, but they encouraged dating to literally reflect and literally replicate that narrow demographic of college student out into the world. And this daily campus writer explicitly said that accepting black students would be detrimental to that cause. That's some pretty heavy stuff. But let's suspend disbelief for a second. As we know, the Founders' intentions don't disappear. Even after these organizations removed segregation from their bylaws, IFC and Panhellenic at SMU are still overwhelmingly white. There are two other great councils at SMU. National Panhellenic Council, or MPHC, which is historically black, And finally, Multicultural Greek Council, or MGC, which historically encompasses a broader swath of minorities, though the council's origins are largely Latinx. NPHC and MGC were both formed in opposition to historically white Greek life to foster the social and academic advancement and retention of minority students. NPHC and MGC both have meaningful student populations on campus. They are smaller for obvious reasons like the amount of students of color on campus, but they also face significant resource disparities compared to IFC and Panhellenic. Okay, okay. You've met all our councils now. To review, 
IFC, Panhellenic, NPHC, and MGC. Ooh, if you haven't encountered the council system before, it's gonna take a second to catch on, but trust me, you will. So now that we know about all the councils, let's meet students from each one. We already met Kelsey, who is the member of a Panhellenic organization. So now let's meet Brady. My name's Brady Martin. Uh, I'm a junior at SMU. I'm involved in Greek life. Brady is currently involved in an IFC organization. He identifies as white. Brady and Kelsey are going to share their complex, multifaceted truths about existing in white Greek spaces. And from the beginning, they came in from very different positions. I think entering SMU, I never wanted to go outside of California. And I would say for a lot of human rights students, the human rights program is what attracted me to SMU. To be honest, um, growing up just in high school, I wasn't surrounded by a lot of people who looked different than me. I was uh, raised in a very white community. I knew what I was getting myself into. I had looked up the statistics of representation, the diversity at SMU or rather lack thereof, like I was aware of it. Um, but I've always kind of operated with the motto of like, be the change you want to see. So I'm like, okay, don't let the fact that you don't see yourself everywhere deter you from entering that space. So. So Brady and Kelsey came in with significantly different levels of racial consciousness. Plus, I think it's important to note that Kelsey had a bigger mission coming into the university, coming into Greek life. She wanted to be the change she wished to see. Her mere existence in that space was proof of that change. Entering campus, I had met a lot of upperclassmen, um, especially through some of the other student organizations I was involved in, and really connected with them. And a lot of these individuals were in Greek life. And so definitely getting to know them, I learned a lot about the different chapters and which one I, I might want to join. And there really seemed this value of friendship within these organizations. I had met some amazing guys, and I, I thought that I wanted to be associated with these people and, and be in an organization with them because I thought they were great people doing great things on campus. The values of education, um, just being driven in school and involved on campus, uh, I, I believe that'd be really beneficial to my experience on SMU's campus. This is the thing, when you don't have anybody in your family that's been a part of something like ISU or Penn Atlantic, you truly don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, you truly only know as much as, you know, the perfect picture that is being shown to the public of like, oh, you know, you're going to go through recruitment, you're going to, you know, trust the process and you'll end up somewhere that like you're supposed to be. Trust the process. But the process isn't equally accessible to everyone. According to Kelsey, there's a lot that goes unsaid. I think what people don't talk about enough, though, is that when you come to SMU, you have this whole semester to kind of figure things out. I didn't know that it was okay to express that you were interested. Oh, since you're going to be going through a career in the spring, you should probably, you know, situate yourself socially around people that are also going through recruitment. It's just little things like that that now when I reflect on it, it's like, Kelsey, you should have come up with this. You're smarter than that. You should have, like, realized that was something. But then also comparing it to the knowledge that I had about historically Black sororities, there's a level of discretion that is held in that community where you're not supposed to talk about it. That's just what people expect, and so I kind of brought that over into Panhellenic. I want to be totally transparent to give some context for how I'm framing this episode. Coming into SMU as a South Asian American, I was pretty skeptical of Greek life. I thought a lot about the high cost of participation, the rush process, 
the implications of legacies when some people's parents weren't even allowed to be a part of the system. But I hadn't considered these intangible factors that Kelsey talked about. So much of the Greek process goes unspoken. It's passed down by word of mouth or media, but it's inaccessible to Kelsey, who came into college with the express interest of joining Greek life. It just begs the question, how could that be? So you heard Kelsey and Brady's perspectives of Greek life coming in, and you've heard some of mine. Now let's turn to someone in multicultural Greek life. So my name is Jessica Pires Jankozi, and I am an alum of SMU. I graduated in 2018. Jessica identifies as Indian and white, mixed race, and she came in with a deeply different perspective on Greek life. So what role did ISC and Panhellenic Greek life play in your initial kind of experiences at SMU? I knew that they were a big deal because so many people around me were talking about them. I was aggressively opposed to them. <laughs> IFC and Panhellenic Greek life, and to some extent Greek life in general, but you know, there are nuances, um, kind of uphold the very worst qualities of masculinity and femininity. Like, I feel as though IFC fraternities, they usually require like an ultra masculine type of guy. And this usually relies on disparaging women in the process or really like anyone who's different. And I felt like Panhellenic kind of reinforced all of the worst stereotypes around femininity. Of course, as freshmen, you'll go to the IFC parties because that's, you know, what everyone is doing. That's what all the freshmen are doing. But I think that while they were fun and, you know, you like go and you drink and you dance and do whatever, I just remember at those parties and in those spaces feeling so invisible. Like I would walk through the door, you know, nobody wants to dance with you. You know, as a freshman, you're like, ooh, are guys going to come up and talk to me? You know, no guys want to talk to you. I had negative stereotypes to begin with, and I think going to those parties reinforced a lot of those stereotypes for me. We all come in looking for our community in college, and we all look in different places. But like I said, Greek life is kind of synonymous with social life in many respects. There are important nuances to keep in mind, but to a certain extent, that holds true for all Greek organizations, including multicultural and national Panhellenic. Here's Jessica on what drew her to her multicultural organization. See, as a freshman, you're kind of just trying to get your feet under you. As a sophomore, you start to get a little more settled and you look around you and, you know, kind of some of those initial friendships that you make as a freshman have fallen by the wayside. Um, I was at a point my sophomore year where I was like, okay, who do I want to have as my community? While I was friends with other black and brown people, I didn't necessarily feel a sense of community and I was really craving that. And I also had realized that, you know, social life at SMU unfortunately just does function around Greek life. Most of my best friends are sisters that I met through my time at SMU. At the same time though, I wish that students of color, well, all students, but especially students of color could find community without having to turn to Greek life. But those are my options at the time. It's important to point out that many students of color, people like Jess, are expressly searching for diversity in their organizations. But that doesn't really hold true for everyone. So I asked Kelsey why she joined a Panhellenic organization instead of organizations that historically center students of color? I, I would say, speaking through my experience as a Black student coming to SMU, you either decide to really, you know, jump into the Black student community at SMU and like really go like full on in that community, being involved in all the different organizations, all the different meetings, 
or you're the type of person that's like, you know, I don't feel like I have to go full on to know who I am to like have my identity like as a black person at the end of the day I'm still black I don't have to be full on involved in all these organizations to like prove that to myself um or feel like I need that sense of community in that sense and sometimes people can fall in between um I think I was kind of like the latter of like not feeling like I needed to be super like in things like like oh like uh, I don't know it just felt very weird for me because I'm the type of person that like I can get along with everybody or like anybody um and I don't want the color of my skin or whatever to be like my soul like identifying thing that makes me connect with people Um, I was never that way, like, in high school, so it didn't make sense for me to come to college and do that. Throughout the interview, Kelsey underscored that she came into college wanting to be the change she wished to see in the world. She wanted to be a positive representation. That being said, Kelsey also noted that multicultural and national Panhellenic Greek organizations didn't have the same campus presence and resource supports as their white Greek counterparts. And as we'll explore throughout this episode and in the next one, that's not on accident. But yeah, all of these considerations together prompted Kelsey to rush a Panhellenic organization. Okay, I know how this has all sounded so far. A lot of the historical context I've given about Greek life hasn't been positive. Reflecting and replicating a narrow demographic of college students, whether that be within each organization or encouraging, quote, fraternization. And of course, since this podcast is about race, I have to talk about it. I have to talk about how segregation was written into the bylaws about how, even now, IFC and Panhellenic organizations are still overwhelmingly white. Whiter than the rest of campus, which is whiter than the rest of America, and that's not even assessing the price of dues and how many students are excluded from the process from the get-go. We can critique systemic racism in IFC and Panhellenic, But how do students actually experience this racism? Do they? I asked Kelsey and Brady about any racially charged moments that they experienced. I genuinely in the moment can't think of any specific examples. I'll try to, um, I'll try to, I'm trying to think. um... It's kind of one of those situations where not everything is like overt you know like fully like when we look at you know like oh this happened and we call it racism sometimes it's not always racism but there are certainly microaggressions when when race is brought up um and it, it's presented in a way that's that's a joke so if, if you if you try to you know confront it and say hey this is extremely problematic that you said this one thing um you know about this cer- about this certain race then oftentimes it's it's presented as oh this is just a joke i'm not actually racist extremely defensive about it there are certainly moments when things would happen and i would be reminded like oh yeah i'm the only black person here right now so why are you coming after me i'm not racist why would you ever think i'm racist this is just just not serious this is just so it's like little stuff it's like random some members really loving to get tanned and you know sometimes you have people that are like wow to the to the person that just got a tan like wow you're so dark oh you like blended into the dark background of this picture and it's like wow people are really talking about how dark this girl's tan is but it's like I'm sitting here like as a black person like looking at you know the picture and it's like she looks the same color as me do I make a comment how like it's weird that y'all are saying this or do I play into the joke 
Okay, I only expect the people I interview to be as transparent as I'm willing to be. I was someone who Instagram stalks some sororities here and there, but beyond that, I haven't really meaningfully interacted with Greek life. And it kind of shows. What was I looking for from that question? Some sort of highly problematic bat signal or something? And this is by no means meant to trivialize either of their experiences, especially Kelsey's. But still, I'm not quite sure what I was expecting. Then, I reflect on my experience here. There are so many intangible moments that have characterized my experience as a student of color. Misunderstandings, miscommunications, no communication at all, isolation. So many times where I feel like the person I'm talking to is looking right past my shoulder, but not in my eyes, not really looking to see me. It's a balancing act. Do I stand for something and risk people thinking I'm overreacting or being too sensitive? Okay, Kelsey, like maybe you're overthinking this, like, you know, maybe... Maybe it's not that serious, but it's, you know, and, and I reflect on it, it's like, yeah, it was weird. Like, they shouldn't have been, you know, making comments like that. The problems happen at SMUs because the people put themselves in this bubble and don't even realize there are so many vast communities on SMU's campus. A lot of us at SMU, I would say the vast majority come from predominantly white communities. Like I said, I'm, I'm from a predominantly white community. So I'd say that that creates this one level of insulation. And then you take all these students and you put them at SMU. So now you're, you're in an even more white community, more insulated, even though it seemed impossible, from your hometowns. And it seems like you can't get any more insulated than that. But then I would say that in Greek life, that's another level of insulation. So now you're in an organization that is even more white than SMU's campus, almost 100% white. My freshman year, I went to like everybody's events. I was going to stuff hosted by the um, Association of Black Students, um, like the Korean Student like Association, you know, and just seeing the different things that people put on, it makes you have a worldly view and you just understand people better. And I think that is like the root of the issue at SMU is a lot of people and particularly a lot of the people in IC and Panhellenic just don't step out of that bubble, <laughs> you know, and don't that we have, don't even know that we have historically black organizations on this campus, you know, and, and that's sad, especially if you say that you are a part of Greek life and you love Greek life, that you don't understand all parts of it because you know I'll say that those people in the historically black organizations and multicultural organizations definitely know what panhellenic organizations are and what ISC organizations are. So there are structural issues with IFC and panhellenic and they are experienced by the students in those organizations but like Kelsey suggested earlier People of color are barred from Greek life at every stage of the process. I think as more people that are already, you know, in their places of privilege in these organizations recognize that they have the power to change the way their organizations look, more things will be done to at least try to rectify the injustices that have been done within Greek life. I always like to emphasize that it's not the job of the potential new member who is, you know, a person of color to fight their way in. You know, sometimes I feel like I kind of really have to fight my way in sometimes. There has to be some consciousness that it is taking a lot for that little brown girl, that little black girl, you know, to go through recruitment right now. And that can't be just me being the only black person in the room you know, on the other side of things saying like, okay, like, let's look at the fact that this is a little brown and black girl going through recruitment. Take note of that courage and take note of how different that is, especially at a school like SMU. It can't just be them trying to, you know, break down the door. It can't just be me trying to pull open the door for them. It has to be everybody acknowledging, 
you know, that knock at the door and, and willing to unlock the door for them and let them in. It would be hypocritical of me to complain about those experiences, I feel, just because I do realize that I chose to be the one person in this space. I don't know, sometimes I think about it like that, you know, that whole, like, be the change you want to see, but know that there's going to be some, you know, like, not every experience you're going to have is going to be, you know, positive once you are trying to be that new face in a room full of, you know, people that have probably honestly never been closely connected to somebody that looks like you before. Oh my gosh. That last part has really, really stuck with me ever since Kelsey and I talked. Hypocritical definitely doesn't feel like the right word to describe righteous negative feelings towards injustice. But then I think of some of the desegregators that I interviewed in my last episode and how they had to bear the brunt so that people afterwards had a smoother path. That doesn't justify the injustice and discomfort that people face when they're breaking ground, representing their identity. But we also have to acknowledge that historically white Greek organizations are still in somewhat early stages of desegregation. IFC and Panhellenic may be capable of change, but it still bears acknowledging These organizations are still carrying out the original quest to reflect and replicate a narrow demographic of college student. The steep social and economic barriers to entry are perpetuating that cycle. If you're a member of an IFC or Panhellenic organization, I hope you see how urgent it is that you step into your power. And as Kelsey expresses, you have to consider where the burden is falling. Change shouldn't be incumbent on people of color like Kelsey. Instead, it will take everyone's participation to bring Greek life into Dr. King's good society. So Kelsey expressed some tangible steps that she's taken to make Greek life more equitable. She's holding the door open. She's being the change she wishes to see. She even says that strangers DM her on Instagram, asking for advice. I also asked Brady his thoughts on reforming Greek life. Quite frankly, these organizations are concentrated with white males. Because we already have this structured organization, to me, I think we should take advantage of it. Um, if you have these people that are the ones that you want to address in one, in one space, I think that we should enter that. We have this conversation every year about sexual assault. And so if we're going to have that conversation, why don't we have one about racial injustice? And I think it should be presented in a formal and productive way, but I also think that it should be extremely blunt. I also think it would be very important for all of the chapter presidents, and this includes sororities, to meet at least once a semester, maybe before rush week, to have these conversations about diversity, accessibility, um, equality, within their organizations. That's interesting because I thought that CIQ at SMU required like cultural sensitivity training in Greek mm-hmm. life. Yeah, and, and that is required, but I would say that it's not, I feel like it's not widespread knowledge. But yeah, I definitely think that that conversation is that we just need to reflect why why is it predominantly white? Um, and And actually taking action on okay, what, what can we do to, to really make an effort to, to reach out to those populations? Some of these resources already exist, but actively aren't utilized. Then, as Kelsey mentioned, there's the issue of the bubble effect. So many students aren't aware of racial injustice on this campus because they aren't actively affected by it. And predominantly white Greek life isn't a space conducive to those conversations. I really appreciated Brady's thoughts, but I couldn't help but think Greek life is swimming in really deep waters. And I think it's really, really important here to offer a platform to a very different perspective. Here's a question I asked Jess. 
She's well versed in activism and social change, and I wanted to hear her perspective on the issue of Greek life. There's just a lot of different social change theories in like reform versus abolition. Do you think that predominantly white Greek life can be reformed? No, girl, abolish it. Like, just get rid of it. Let's clarify some terms before we get to her explanation. Reform versus abolition. Abolition is told that the systems that they seek to abolish can't exist in any capacity that doesn't uphold and perpetuate white supremacy. So basically, any attempt to approve upon or reform an existing system is ignoring the root of the problem. Think back to the first time you heard that term, abolition. It was probably in a history class learning about slavery. Whenever you hear someone advocate for abolition, they're very deliberately drawing upon that legacy. I remember watching this video that was talking about how many congressmen, you know, White House staffers, former presidents were all part of fraternities. And I was like, damn, okay, so IFC and probably to some extent Panhellenic, They're just tools for maintaining white supremacy, right? They're literally exclusionary groups that are based on legacy for you to be a part of them. And of course you can join without legacy, but but no, they're a tool for maintaining wealth and white supremacy and excluding people who are different. And I don't think that that can be reformed. Though this podcast is SMU specific, I want to give you some terms and ideas and language that apply beyond this university. I thought it was important to include an abolitionist argument here because that's a term that's been circulating in different contexts. You may have heard it applied to police, especially during the 2020 resurgence of Black Lives Matter. So as you're deciding what maladjustment looks like to you, and how it affects how you navigate the world, you can trust yourself to come to your own conclusions, but I do want you to hold space for the possibility that there's some institutions that are adjusted in themselves. At very least, it's a new set of shared language. It's a new opportunity to tell the truth as we see it. And that's what's going to guide us into the good society. As I mentioned, you get to decide where you direct your energy. Reform, abolition, whatever solution moves you. But because Greek life commands such an outsized portion of resources on this campus, this comes at the direct expense of other organizations particularly those dedicated to serving students of color. So we're basically at the end, and this is going to get very meta for a second, so bear with me. But making this episode stressed me out. So much of this process took place at home during COVID times. Sorry for even invoking that name here, guys, but I had to. But still, even when I was just sitting in the grass outside or in my apartment, I couldn't help but consider the massive columns in front of Greek houses about how big and imposing they feel and how small I feel in comparison. And I also know that there's so much more to multicultural and national Panhellenic Greek life that I've yet to cover. So to recenter ourselves after big ideas of systemic dysfunction and reform versus abolition, I want to center our attention on a quote by Dr. Ibram Kendi. Referencing the effects of IFC and Panhellenic housing, he notes that they render outside populations, quote, socially homeless to the majority 
with no virtual or physical dwelling, unquote. I found that quote extremely powerful, especially when it came up multiple times when researching this episode, that multicultural Greek council had a house that was recently demolished. Some national Panhellenic organizations also had houses that no longer exist. There used to be a house dedicated to Black and Chicano students that no longer exists. So there was a time where students that were part of those organizations, primarily students of color, were not, quote, socially homeless, invisible to the majority, with no virtual or physical dwelling. But they're not here anymore. Living in a time of COVID, when the whole world had to quarantine, the idea of shared space, or lack thereof, was heavy on my mind. Next episode, let's talk about the history of buildings and spaces dedicated to students of color.